Ranger's Apprentice, Book 2, The Burning Bridge by John Flanagan Chapter 28 Balmaster David chewed the ends of his moustache as he frowned at the plan outlined on the sand table. I don't know, Hall, he said doubtfully. It's very risky. One of the first principles of warfare is never to split your forces. Hall nodded. He knew the knight's criticism was intended to be constructive, not simply negative thinking. It was Sir David's role to find any faults in the plan and weigh them against possible advantages. That's true, but it's also true that surprise is a powerful weapon, the ranger replied. Baron Tyler walked around the table, considering the plan from another viewpoint. He pointed with his dagger at the mass of green that represented the Fawn Tree Forest. You're sure you and Gillen can guide a large cavalry force through the Fawn Tree? I thought nobody could get through there. He asked dubiously, and Holt nodded. The rangers have charted and surveyed every inch of the kingdom for years, my lord, he told the baron. Especially the parts people think there's no way through. If we can surprise this northern force, then Morgoth will be caught out as well, with no Scandians turn up behind us. Tyler continued to pace around the table, staring intently at the design drawn there, and the marker set in place at the sand map. All the time, he said, would be in a pretty scrape if the Scandians defeat Hall and the cavalry over there in the north. After all, you'd be outnumbered almost two to one. Hall not in agreement again. That's true, but we'll catch them in open country, so we'll have the advantage. And don't forget, we'll be taking 200 archer units as well. They should even the numbers a little. An archer unit consisted of two men, one archer and one accompanying spearman, mutually supporting each other. Against lightly armored infantry, they were a deadly combination. Able to cut down large numbers at a distance, then retreat before their enemy could come up to grips with them. But, let's assume that the Scandians do manage to win though. Then the tails will be turned, we'll be fighting a real enemy in the northwest, with our rear exposed to Morgoth's walkers coming out of the pass, said Baron Tyler. Harold managed to suppress a sigh. As a strategist, Tyler was notoriously cautious. On the other hand, he said, doing thing his best to keep impatient out of his voice. If Holt succeeds, it will be in his fault that Morgoth of Sea is coming around from the northwest. He'll assume it's the Scandians attacking us from that direction, and he'll bring his forces onto the plains to attack us from behind, and then we'll have him once and for all. The prospect seems to appeal to him. It's still a risk, Tyler said stubbornly. Holt and Errol exchanged a glance, and the burn shoulder lifted slightly in a shrug. Holt said in a dry tone, All warfare has a risk attached to it, sir. Otherwise it would be easy. Baron Tyler looked up angrily at him. Holt made his gaze evenly. As the Baron opened his mouth to say something, Sir David forestalled him, smacking one gauntlet into his palm in a decisive gesture. All right, Holt, he said. I'll put your plan to the king. At the mention of the king, Hall's face softened slightly. How is his majesty taking the news? He asked, and Sir David shrugged unhappily. Personally, he's devastated, of course. It was the cruelest possible blow to have his hopes raised and then shattered again. But he manages somehow to put his personal life to one side and continue to perform his duties as king. He says he'll mourn later when this is all over. There may be no need for mourning, Harold put in, and David smiled sadly at him. I've told him that, of course. He said he'd prefer not to have his false hopes raised once more. There was an awkward silence in the tent. Tyler, Fergus, and Sir David felt deep sorrow for the king. Duncan was a popular and just monarch. Hold and Baron Harold, on the other hand, both felt the loss of all deeply. In a remarkably short time, Will had become an integral part of Castle Redmond. Finally, it was Sir David who broke the silence. Gentlemen, perhaps you might begin preparing your orders. I'll take this plan to the king. And as he turned away to the inner sections of the pavilion, the barons and hall left the large tent. Harold, Fergus and Tyler walked quickly away to prepare movement orders for the army. Hall seeing a dejected figure in ranger green and grain waiting by the sentry post moved down the small hill to talk to his former apprentice. I want to I want leave to go to across the fissure after them, said Gillen. 
Folk knew how deeply he felt that hurt, the hurt of Will's loss. Galen blamed himself for leaving Will alone in the hills of Celtica. No matter how many times Holt and the other rangers told him that he'd taken the right course, he refused to believe it. Now Holt knew it would hurt him even more to be refused. Nevertheless, as rangers, their first duty was to the kingdom. He shook his head and answered courtly. Not granted. You're needed here. We are to lead a force through the thorn tree to cut off horse men, go to Crowley's tent and get hold of the charts showing the secret ways for this part of the country. Gillen hesitated. His jaw said, but he began to protest, and then something in Holt's eyes stopped him as the older ranger leaned forward. Gillen, don't you think for one moment that I don't want to tear that plateau apart stone by stone until I find him? But you and I took an oath when they gave us these silver oak leaves, and now we have to live up to it. Gillen dropped his eyes and nodded. His shoulders slumped as he gave in. All right. He said in a broken tone, and Hall thought he saw traces of tears in his eyes. He turned away hurriedly before Killen could see the moisture in his own. Get the charts, he said briefly. The four Scandians and their prisoners had trudged across the bleak windswept plateau for the rest of the day and into the evening. It wasn't until several hours after dark that Irrod called a halt, and Will and Evelyn sank gratefully to the rocky ground. The egg in Will's head had receded somewhat through the day, but it still throbbed dully in the background. The dry blood on the wound where the jack rock had hit him itched abominably, but he knew that if he scratched it in the irritation, he would only open the wound and set the blood flowing once more. At least, thought Will, Eric hadn't kept them tired or restrained in any way. As the Scandian leader put it, there was nowhere for the two prisoners to run. This plateau is full of war goals, he told them roughly. You can take your chance with them if you choose. So they kept their position in the middle of the party, passing bands of war goals throughout the day, and heading constantly to the northeast and three step pass. Now the four Scandians eased their heavy packs to the ground, and Nordal began to gather wood for a fire. Svengal tossed a large copper pot at Evelyn's feet, and gestured towards a stream that bubbled through the rocks close by. Get some water. He told her gruffly. For a moment, the girl hesitated. Then she shrugged, took up the pot, and rose, groaning softly as her tired muscles and joints were called upon once more to take her weight. Come on, then, Will, she said casually. You can give me a hand. Eric was rummaging in his open sack. His head snapped around as he spoke. No, he said sharply, and the entire group turned back to look at him. He pointed one blunt forefinger at Evelyn. You! I don't mind you wandering off, because I know you'll come back, but as for that ranger, he might just take it into his head to make a run for it in spite of things. Will, who had been thinking of doing just that, tried to look surprised. I'm no ranger, I'm just an apprentice. Hera gave a short snort of laughter. <laughs> you may say so, he replied, but you drop them walkers at the bridge as well as any ranger might. You stay where I can keep an eye on you. Will shrugged, smiled vainly at Evelyn, and sat down again, sighing as he leaned his back against the rock. In a few moments, he knew it would become hard and knobbly and uncomfortable. But right now, it was a bliss. The Scandians went ahead making camp. In short order, they had a good fight going, and when Evelyn returned with the pot full of water, Eric and Swindle produced dried provisions, which they added to the water as it heated to make a stew. The meal was plain and fairly tasteless but it was hot and it filled their bellies. Will thought ruefully for a few minutes of the prepared food that came from Master Chop's kitchen. Sadly, he realized that such thought of Master Chop's kitchen and his time in the forest would halt were no more than memories now, and the meal was suddenly even more tasteless than before. Evelyn seemed to sense his deepening sadness. He felt a warm small hand cover his and he knew she was looking at him but he couldn't meet those vivid green eyes with his own, feeling the tears welling up in them. It'll be all right, she whispered. He tried to talk, but couldn't form the words. Silently, he took his head, his eyes downcast, staring intently at the scr scratched surface of the wooden bowl the Scandians had given him to use. They were camped some meters from the side of the road, at the top of a slight rise. Eric had stated that he'd like to see anyone who might choose to approach.
now rounding a bend in the road several hundred meters away, came a large group of horsemen, followed by a troop of walkers, running to keep up with the horse's trot. The sound of the walkers' chant came in to them on the breeze once more, and Will felt the hairs on the back of his neck rising. Eric turned swiftly to the two of them, just throwing them back into the cover of the rocks behind the campsite. Quick, you two! Behind them rocks if you value your lives! That's Morgoroth himself on the white horse! Nordal, Horak, move into the light to screen them. Will and Emily needed no second biting. Saying low, they scrambled into the cover provided by the rocks. As Eric had commanded, two of the Scanians stood and moved into the glare of the firelight, drawing the attention of the approaching riders away from the two small figures in half-light. The chain mingled with the clatter of hooves, and a chink of harness and weapons came closer as Will lay on his stomach, one arm covering Evelyn in darkness. As he had done before, he scooped the hood of his cloak over his head to leave his face in deep shadows. There was a tiny gap between two of the rocks, and knowing he was taking a terrible risk when unable to resist, he pressed his eye to it. The view was restricted to a few meters of space. Eric stood on the far side of the fire, facing the approaching riders. Will realized that by doing so, he had placed the glare of the firelight between new arrivals in a spot where he and Evelyn lay hidden. If any of the walkers looked in that direction, they would be staring straight into the bright firelight. It was a lesson in tactics he filed away for future reference. The sound of horses and men stopped. The walkers' chant died abruptly. For a second or two, there was silence. Then a voice spoke, a low voice with a slight snake-like sibilance to it. Captain Erak. Where are you bound? Will glued his eyes to the crack in the rocks, straining to see the speaker. Without a doubt, that cold, malevolent voice had to belong to Morgoroth. The sound of it was the sound of ice and hatred. The sound of nails scraping on tile. The blood ran cold to hear it, and beneath his hand he felt Evelyn shiver. It had a similar effect on Erak, however. He showed no sign of it. My title, Lord Morgoroth, he said evenly. It's not Captain, but Jarl. Well then, replied the cold voice, I must try to remember that, in case it is ever of the slightest interest to me. Now, Captain, he said, laying stress on the title this time, I repeat, oh, where are you bound? There was a jingle of harness, and through the crack in the rocks, Wolf saw a white horse move forward. Not a glossy coated shining white horse, such as a gallant knight might ride, but a pale horse, without sheen or life to its coat. He was huge, dead white, and with wild rolling eyes. He craned slightly to one side, and managed to make out a black glove hand holding the reins loosely. We see no more of the rider. We thought we'd join your force at a free step pass, my lord, Eric was saying. I assume you will still go ahead with your attack even though the bridge is down. Morgoth swore horribly at the mention of the bridge, sending his fury the white horse sidestepped a few paces, and now Will could see the rider. Immensely tall, but thin, he was dressed all in black. He stopped in the saddle to talk down to the Scandians, and hunched shoulders on his back cloak gave him the look of a vulture. The face was thin, with a beak of a nose and high cheekbones. The skin on the face was white and pale like the horse. The hair above it was long set to frame a receding hairline, and white blonde in color. By contrast, the eyes were black pools. He was clean shaven, and his mouth was a thin red slit in the paler of his face. As Will looked, the Lord of Rain and Night seemed to sense his presence. He looked up, casting his gaze beyond Erak and his three companions, searching into the darkness behind them. Will froze, barely daring to breathe as those black eyes searched the night, but the light of the fire defeated Morgoroth and he turned his gaze to Erak. Yes, he replied. The attack will go on ahead, now that Duncan has his own forces deployed, and what he thinks is a strong defensive position, he'll allow us to come out onto the plains before attacking. At which point, Holt will take him in the rear, Erak put in with a chuckle. And Morgoth stared at him, head slightly to one side, as he considered him again. Again the bird-like pose made Will think of a vulture. Exactly, he agreed. It would be preferable if there were two flanking forces, as I planned originally. But one should be enough. My thoughts too, my lord, Eric agreed, 
and there was a long moment of silence. Obviously, Morgoth had no interest in whether Irak agreed with him or not. Things would be easier if your other countrymen had not abandoned us, Morgoth said eventually. I've been told that your compatriot Olvak has sailed back to Scandia with his men. I planned that they could come up the southern cliffs to reinforce us. Eric shrugged, refusing to take the blame for something outside of his sphere of influence. Olvak is a mercenary, he said. You can't trust mercenaries, they fight only for profit. And you... don't? The toneless voice said with scorn. Eric squared his shoulders. I'll honor any undertaking I've made, he said stiffly. Morgoth stared at him for a long silent moment. Scandian met his gaze, and finally lost Morgoth who looked away. Shirath told me you took a prisoner at the bridge. A mighty warrior, he said. I don't see him. Again Morgoth tried to look through the light into the fire of gloom. Eric laughed harshly. <laughs> if Shirath was the leader of your walkers, neither did he, he replied sarcastically. He spent most of his time at the bridge, covering behind a rock and dodging arrows. And the prisoner? Morgoth asked. Dead, Eric replied. We killed him and threw him over the edge. A fact that displeases me intensely, Morgoth said and Will felt his flesh crawling. I would have preferred to make him suffer for interfering with my plans. You should have brought him to me alive. And we would have preferred if he hadn't been whipping arrows around our ears. The only way to make take him was to kill him. Another silence as Morgoth considered the reply. Apparently it was not satisfactory to him. Be warned for the future. I do not approve of your actions. This time it was Eric who let the silence stretch. He shrugged his shoulders slightly, as if Morgoth's displeasure was a matter of absolutely no interest to him. Eventually, the Lord of Rain and Night gathered his reins and shook them, healing his horse savagely to return it away from the campfire. I'll see you at Free Step Pass, Captain, he said. Then almost as an afterthought, he turned his horse back. Oh, and Captain? Don't get any ideas about deserting. You'll fight us to the end. Eric nodded. I told you, my lord. I'll honor any bargain I've made. This time Morgo smiled, thin movement of the red lips in the lifeless white face. Be sure of it, Captain, he said softly. Then he shook the reins, and his horse turned away, springing to a gallop. The walkers followed the chain starting up again and ringing through the night. Will realized that, behind the rocks, he'd been holding a giant breath. He let it go now and heard a corresponding sigh of relief from the Scandians. My god of battles, said Eric. He doesn't half give me the creeps, that one. Looks like he's already died and gone to hell, put in Svengal, and the others nodded. Eric walked around the fire now and stood over where Will and Evelyn were, still crouched behind the rocks. You heard that? he said, and Will nodded. Evelyn remained crouching face down behind the rock. Eric stirred her roughly with the toe of his boot. What about you, Missy? He said, his voice harsh. You heard too? Now she looked up, tears of terror straining tracks in the dust on her face. Wordlessly, she nodded. Eric fixed her gaze with his own until he was sure the threats were fully understood. Then remember it. If you start thinking about escape, he said coldly. That's all that awaits you if you get away from us. Chapter 29 the plains of Uthal formed a wide open space of rolling grasslands. The grass was rich and green, there were few trees, although occasional knolls and low hills served to break the monotony. Some distance behind the position occupied by the Ireland army, the plains began to rise gradually to a low ridge line. Closer to the fence, where the Porkles were forming up, a creek wound its way. Normally a mere trickle had been swollen by the recent spring rains so that the grounds ahead of the walkers were soft and soggy, precluding any possible attack by the Erolan heavy cavalry. Baron Fergus shaded his eyes against the bright noon sun and peered across the plains to the entrance to Free Step Pass. There are a lot of them, he said mildly. And more coming, Errol of Redmond replied, easing his broadsword a little in its scabbard. The two barons were slowly walking their battle horses across the front of Duncan's drawn-up army. It was good for morale, Harold believed. 
for the men to see their leaders relaxed and engaging in casual conversation as they watched their enemies emerging from the narrow mountain pass and fanning out onto the plains. Dimly they could hear the ominous rhythmic chant of the walkers as they jerked into position. Damn, noise is quite unnerving, Rogus muttered, and Errol nodded agreement. Seemingly casual, he cast his glance over the men behind them. The army was in position, but Battlemaster David had told them to remain at rest. Consequently, the cavalry were dismounted, and the infantry and archers were sitting on the grassy slope. No sense in wearing them down, standing at attention in the sun, David had said, and the others had agreed. By the same token, he had set the various kitchen masters to task of keeping the men supplied with cool drinks and fruit. The white-clad servers moved among the army now, carrying baskets and water skins. Errol glanced down and smiled at the portly form of Master Chop, his chef from Redmond Castle, supervising a group of hapless apprentices as they handing out apples and peaches to the men. As ever, his saddle rose and fell with alarming frequency on the heads of the any apprentices he deemed to be moving too slowly. Give that kitchen master of yours a maze, and he could rout Morgoth's army single-handed, commented Fergus, and Errol smiled thoughtfully. The men around Chubb and his apprentices, distracted by the fat cook's antics, were taking no notice of the chanting from the across the plains. In other areas, he could see signs of restlessness, evidence that the men were becoming increasingly ill at ease. Looking around, Errol's eye fell on infantry captain seating with his company. The minimal armor, plaid cloaks, and two other broadswords marked them as belonging to one of the northern thieves. He beckoned the man over and leaned down from the saddle as he saluted. Morning, captain, he said easily. Morning, my lord, replied the officer, his heaven northern accent, marking the words almost unrecognizable. Tell me, captain. Do you have Pipers among your men? The Baron asked, smiling. The officer answered immediately in a very serious manner. Aye, sir. The MacDog and the MacFawn are with us, and always so when we go to war. Then perhaps you might prevail upon them to give us a reel or two? The Baron suggested. It might be an altogether more pleasant sound than that tuneless grunting from over yonder. He inclined his head towards the Wargal forces and now a slow smile spread over the captain's face. He nodded readily. Aye, sir, I'll see to it. There's nothing like a skirl or two on the pipes to get a man's blood prancing. Saluting hurriedly, he turned away towards his men, shouting as he ran, Macaduck, Macfern, gather your wind and set the pipes, men. Let's hear of the feather-crested bonnet for thee. As the two barons rode on, they heard behind them the preliminary moaning of bagpipes coming to full volume. Fergus winced and Errol grinned at him. Nothing like the skirl of the pipes to get the blood prancing, he quoted. In my case, it gets the teeth grinding, replied his companion, surreptitiously, nudging his heart with his heel to move them a little further away from the wild sound of the pipes. But when he looked at the men behind them, he had to agree that Errol's idea had worked. The pipes were successfully drowning out the dull chanting, and as the two pipers marched and countermarched in front of the army, he held the attention of all the men in the media vicinity. Good idea, he said to Errol, then added. I can't help wondering if that's an equally good one. He gestured across the plain to where the woggles were emerging from the pass and taking up their positions. All my instincts say we should be hitting them before they have a chance to form up. Errol shrugged. This point had been hotly debated by the war council for the past few days. If we hit them as they come out, we simply contain them, he said. If we want to destroy Morgoth's power once and for all, we have to let him commit his forces to the open. And hope that Holt had been successful in subbing half army, Berger said. I'm getting a nasty crick in my neck from looking over my shoulder to make sure there are no one behind us. Holt has never let us down before, Errol said mildly. Fergus nodded unhappily. I know, I know, he's a remarkable man. But there's so many things that could have gone wrong. He could have missed Hall's army altogether. He may still be fighting his way through the thorn tree. Or worse yet, Hoth may have defeated his archers and cavalry. There's nothing we can do about it now, but wait, Harold pointed out, and keep an eye on the northwest, hoping we don't see battle axes and horned helmets coming over the hills. There's a comforting thought, 
said Earl, trying to make light of the moment. Yet he couldn't resist the temptation to turn in his saddle and peer anxiously towards the hill in the north. Eric had waited till the last few hundred woggles were moving down three step past to the plains, then forced his small group into the middle of the jerking creatures. There were a few snarls and scowls as the Scandians shoved their way into the living stream that was rolling through the narrow, twisted confines of the pass, but the heavily armed sea raiders snarled back and handled their double sided battle axes with such easy familiarity that the angry walkers soon backed off and left them alone. Evan, Lynn, and Will were in the center of the group, surrounded by the burly Scandians. Will's easily recognizable ranger cloak had been hidden away in, the, in one of the packs, and both he and Evan Lynn wore sheepskin half capes that were too large for them. Evan Lynn's short hair was bundled up under a woolen cap. So far, none of the walkers had taken any notice of them, assuming them to be servants or slaves to the small band of the sea raiders. Just keep your mouth shut and your eyes down. Eric had told them as they shoved their way into the crowd of jogging walkers. The narrow confines of the pass echoed to the tuneless chanting that the walkers used as a cadence. The sound echoed, ebbed and flowed above them as they half ran with the stream. Eric's plan was to move eastward as soon as they had cleared the pass. Austin Sloopy, with the purpose of taking up a position on the right flank of the walker army, as soon as opportunity presented itself, the Scandians would break off and escape into the swampy wilderness of the Fernlands, traveling through the bogs and grassy islands to the beaches where Hoff's fleet lay at anchor. They huffed along, twisting and turning with the convolution of the pass. The narrow trail led down through the sheer mountains for at least five kilometers, and Will could understand why it had always been a barrier to both sides. Morgoth's men couldn't move out in any large numbers unless Duncan held back and allowed them to. Similarly, the king's army couldn't penetrate the pass to take Morgoth into the plateau. Black walls of sheer, glistening wet rock towered above them on either side. The pass saw sunlight for less than an hour each day, right on high noon. At any other time, it was cold and damp and shrouded in shadow, all of which served to help conceal the presence of the two younger members of the party from prying eyes. Will felt the ground beneath his feet beginning to level out and realized they must be at the least extremities of the pass, down at the level of the plains. There was no way he could even see the ground ahead of them. Trapped in the seething, jostling crowd, they rounded a final bend and the lands of daylight stepped into the pass, forcing him to throw up a hand to shield his eyes. They had reached the entrance, he realized. He felt a shove from his left. Get over to the right, Eric told them, and the four Scandians formed a human wedge, forcing their way through the crowd until they were on the extreme right-hand side of the pass. There were growls and angry grunts from the walkers as they shoved their way through, but the Scandians gave as good as they got in terms of threats and abuse. The sunlight hit them like a physical barrier as they emerged from the darkness of the pass, and for a moment, Will and Evelyn hesitated. Eric shoved them on again, more anxious now as he could hear a familiar voice calling commands for the walkers to deploy. Morgoth was here, directing operations. Curse him, muttered Eric. I'd hoped he'd be out with the vanguard of the army. Keep moving, you two. He shoved Will and Evelyn along a little faster. Will glanced back above the heads of the walkers. He could see the tall, thin form of the Lord of Rain and Night, now clad entirely in black armor, and Surcoat still seated on his white horse and calling instructions to the milling chanting walkers. Gradually, they were moving on into ordered formations, then taking their positions within the main army. As Will looked back, the pale face turned towards the group of hurrying Scandians. Morgoth urged his horse towards them, unmindful of the fact that he was trembling through his own men to reach them. Captain Eric, he called. The voice wasn't loud, but it carried thin and cutting through the chanting of the walkers. Keep moving, Eric ordered them in a low voice. Keep moving. Stop! Now the voice raised and the cold anger in it instantly silenced and still the walkers. Is the frozen place around them. Scandians reluctantly did the same, Eric turning to face Morgor. The Lord of Rain and Night spurred his horse through the throng, walkers falling back to make way for him or being buffeted out of the way if they failed to do so. Slowly as his eyes locked on those of Eric, he dismounted. Even on foot, he towered over the bulky Scandian leader. And where might you and your men be bound today, Captain? 
he asked in a silky tone. Aero gestured to the right. It's normal for me and my men to fight on the right wing, he said, as casually as he could manage. But I'll go wherever you need me, if it doesn't suit. Will you? replied Morgoth with a withering sarcasm. Will you indeed? How terribly kind of you. You... He broke off. His gaze on the two smaller figures whom the other Scanian had been trying to unsuccessfully to shield from his gaze. Who are they? He demanded. Eric shrugged. Kelts, he said easily. We took them prisoner in Keltica, and I'm planning to sell them to Oboyal Ragnar as slayers. Keltica is mine, Captain. Staves from Keltica are mine as well. They're not for you to take and sell to your barbarian of king. The Scandian surrounding Will and Evandin stirred angrily at his words. Morgoth turned his cold eyes on them, then looked away at the thousands of walkers who surrounded them, everyone ready to obey any command of his without question. The message was clear. Eric turned to bluff his way through the situation. Our agreement was we fought for booty and that includes slaves, he insisted. But Morgoth cut him off. If you thought, he shouted fiercely. If! Not if you stood by and let my bridge be destroyed. Was your man Tira, who was in charge command of the bridge? Eric flashed back at him. It was he who decided no guards was be too left at it. We were the ones who tried to save it while we was hiding behind rocks. Morgoth grazed stopped with Eric once more, and now his voice dropped to a low, almost inaudible level. I am not spoken to in that fashion. Captain Erok, he spat, you will apologize to me at once, and then... He stopped in mid-sentence, although he had been staring unblinkingly into Erok's eyes. He had apparently sent something off to one side. Those black eyes now turned on and trained on Will. One white bony finger was raised, pointing at the boy's throat. What's that? Erok looked and felt a sinking sensation in the pit of his stomach. There was a dull gleam of bronze visible in the gap of Will's open collar. Then Eric felt himself shoved to one side as Morgoth moved snake fast and snatched as the chain around Will's neck. Will staggered back, horrified at the implacable fury in those dead eyes and a slight flare of color above the cheekbones. Beside him, he heard Evelyn's intake of breath as Morgoth stared down at the small bronze oak in his hand. A ranger? he raged. This is a ranger! This is their sign! He's a boy, Eric began, but now Morgoth's shield was turned upon him, and he swept his hand in a backhanded blow across the Scandian cheek. He is no boy, he's a ranger! The other three Scandians moved forward at the blow, weapons ready. Morgoth didn't even have to speak. He turned those glittering eyes on them, and twenty Wargals moved as well. A warning growl in their throats, clubs and irons root and spears at the ready. Arrow signals for him meant to settle. The red mark of Morgoth's blow flared on his cheek. You knew, Morgoth accused him. You knew, and realization dawned on him. This is the one. Arrow, she said. My walkers were hiding from arrows at the bridge burned. Ranger weapons. This is the swine who destroyed my bridge. The voice rose to a shriek of fury as he spoke. Will's throat was dry and his heart pounded with terror. He knew of Morgoth's legendary hatred for rangers, all members of the corpse dead. Ironically, it was Holt himself who had triggered that hatred when he had led the surprise attack on Morgoth's army at Hakam Heath 16 years previously. Eros stood before the raging Black Lord and said nothing. Will felt a small warm head creep into his, Evelyn. For a moment, he marveled at the girl's courage to bond herself to him like this. In the face of Morgoth's implacable fury and hatred, then another horse forced his way through the crowd. On his back was one of Morgoth's vocal lieutenants, one of those who had learned basic human speech. My lord, he called in a peculiar flat tone, of all Vogel's enemies advancing. Morgoth swung to face him and the Vogel continued, the skirmish line moving towards us, my lord, battle is beginning. The lord of rain and night came to decision. He swung back into the saddle of his horse, his furious gaze now locked on Will and not Eric. We will finish this later, he said, and he turned to a vocal sergeant among those who had surrounded the Scandians. Hold these prisoners here until I return, on 
pain of your life. Chapter 30 The King's skirmish line, consisting of light infantry accompanied by archers, advanced on Morgrave's left flank in a probing movement, retreating hastily when the battalion of heavy infantry formed up and moved forward to meet them. The lightly armed skirmishers scampered back to the safety of their own lines, ahead of the slow treading walkers. Then as a company of heavy cavalry trotted forward, the walkers' battalions their flank. The walkers reformed their column of four of force marching order to a slower moving defense square and withdrew to their own lines. As most battles, the first moves were inconclusive, and for the next few hours there remained a pattern of the battle. Small forces would probe at each side's defense, outer forces would offer to counter, and the first attack would melt away. Harold, Fergus and Tyler sat in their horses beside the king, on a small knoll in the center of the royal army. Battlemaster David was with a small group of knights, making one of the many forays towards the walkers' army. All this toing and froing is getting me down, Harold said sourly. The king smiled at him. He had one of the most in important attributes of a good commander, almost unlimited patience. Morgoth is waiting, he said simply waiting for Hoff's army to show itself in our rear. Then he'll attack, have no doubt. Let's just get on with it ourselves, growled Fergus. But Duncan shook his head, pointing to the ground immediately to the front of Morgoth's position. The land lay soft and buggy, he said. It could reduce the effectiveness of our best weapon, our cavalry. We'll wait until Morgoth comes to us, then we can fight him on ground that's more to our liking. There was an urgent clatter of hooves from the rear. The royal party turned to watch a courier spurring his horse up to the last look to the knoll where they waited. He hauled on his reins, looked around until he saw the king's blunt head, then dug in his spurs again, eventually bringing his horse to a starting stop beside them. His green surcoat, light mail armor, and thin bladed sword showed him to be a scout. Your Majesty, he said briefly, a report from Sir Vincent. Vincent was the leader of the messenger corps, a group of soldiers who acted as the king's eyes and ears during a battle, carrying reports and orders to all parts of the battlefield. Duncan indicated that the men should go ahead and give the message. The riders followed several times and looked anxiously at the king and his three barons. All at once, Harold knew this was not going to be good news. Sir, he said hesitantly, Sir Vincent respect, respect sir, and there appears to be scandals behind us. There was a startled exclamation from several of the junior officers surrounding the command group. Fergus swung on them, his brows drawn together in a frown. Be quiet, he stormed, and in an instant the noise dropped away. The aides looked shamefaded at their lack of discipline. Exactly where are these Scandians, and how many are there? Duncan asked the scout calmly. His unruffled manner seemed to communicate itself to the messenger. This time he answered with a lot more confidence. The first group is visible on the low ridge to the northwest, Your Majesty. As yet, we can only see hundred or so. Sir Vincent suggests that the best position for you to view the situation would be from the small hill to our left rear. The king nodded and turned to one of the younger officers. Ronald, perhaps you might write and advise Sir David of his, this new development. Tell him we are shifting the command post to the hill Sir Vincent suggested. Yes, my lord, replied the young knight. He wheeled his heart and set off a gallop. The king then turned his, to his companions. Gentlemen, let's see about these Scandians, shall we? Shading his eyes, Baron Ewell peered at the small group of men on the hill behind them. Even at this distance, it was possible to make out the horned helmets and the huge circular shields that the sea raiders carried. A small group had even advanced down on the near side of the hill, and they were easier to make out. Just as obvious was the choice of the typical Scandians' arrowhead formation as they advanced. He estimated that several hundred of the enemy were now in sight, with who knew how many more hidden on the other side of the hills. He felt a great weight of sadness upon his shoulders. The fact that the Scandians were there meant only one thing. Halt had failed, and knowing Halt as he did, he knew that probably meant that the grizzled ranger had died in the attempt. He knew Halt would never have surrendered. Not when the need to stop the Scandians breaking through to the army's rear was so vital. Duncan voiced the thoughts of all of them. The Scandians, all right. He glanced around the hilltop. We're going to have to fight a defensive battle, my lords, he continued. I suggest we begin to pull our men into a circle around this hill. It's a good spot as any to fight on both sides. 
They all knew it was only a matter of time now before Morgoth advanced to cross them between two jaws of the trap he had set. Rider co Riders coming! called one of the aides, pointing. They all turned to face the way he indicated. From the copse of trees at the right hand end of the ridge, a lone rider burst into sight. Several of the Scandians gave chase, hurling spears and clubs after him. He was stretched low over his horse neck, his grey green cloak streaming behind him in the wind, and he soon outdistanced the pursuit. That's Gillan, Baron Errol muttered, recognizing the bay horse he rode. He looked in vain for a second ranger behind Gillan, hoping against hope that Holt might have somehow survived, but it was not to be. The brown shoulder sagged a little as he recalled the force that had marched off so boldly into the thorn tree forest. Of all those men, it seemed that only Gillan had survived. Gillan had hit the flat land now, and was still riding full pelt. He saw the royal standards flying on the knoll and swerved blazed towards them. In a few minutes, he drew rain beside them, covered in dust. One sleeve of his tunic ripped, and a rough bloodstained bandage around his head. Sir, he said briefly, forgetting his niceties of addressing royalty. Hall says you can. He got no further, as at least four people interrupted him. Beryl Fergus's voice, however, was the loudest. Halt? Halt's alive? Gillen grimmed in reply. Oh yes, sir. He's alive and kicking. But but the Scandians, King Duncan began, indicating the lines of men on the far ridge. Gillen's grin widened even further. Beaten, sir. We caught them totally by surprise and cut them to pieces. Those men there are our archers, wearing helmets and shields taken from the enemy. It was Holt's idea. To what purpose? Earl asked crisply, and Gillen turned to face him with an apologetic nod of his head to the king. To deceive Morgoth, my lord, he replied. He's expecting to see Scandians attack you from the rear, and now he will. That's why they even made a pretense of trying to stop me just now. Our own cavalry is just beyond the bow of the ridge. Hall proposes that he should advance with the archers forcing you to turn and face the rear. Then with any luck, as Morgoth attacked with his walkers, both the archers and your main army should open a path through the center, allowing the hidden cavalry to come through and hit Morgoth when he's in the open. By God, it's a great idea, said Duncan enthusiastically. Odds are that we'll stir up so much dust and confusion that he won't see Hall's cavalry until it's right on top of him. Then, my lord, we can deploy the heavy cavalry from either wing to hit the Wargals on their flanks. The new speaker was Sir David. He had arrived unnoticed as Gillen was explaining Hall's plan. King Duncan hesitated for a second or two, tugging at his short beard. Then he nodded decisively. We'll do it, he said. Gentlemen, you better get your commands right away. Fergus, Errol, take a section of the Herald Cavalry each to the left and right wings and stand ready. Tyler, command the infantry in the center. Have them shout and cry out and beat their swords on the shield as these Scandians approach. We'll make it sound like battle as well as look like one. Have them ready to split to their sides at Freehorn's Blast. Freehorn Blast. Aye, my lord said Tyler. He dug his spurs into his battle horse side and galloped away to take command of the infantry. Duncan looked to his remaining commanders. Get to it, my lords. We don't have much time. From behind one of the, his aides called out. Sir, the Scandians are moving downhill. A second or so later, another man echoed the cry. And the walkers are beginning to move forward. Duncan smiled grimly at his commanders. I think it's time we gave Morgoth a little surprise. Chapter 31 From his command position at the center of his army, Morgoth watched the apparent confusion in the king's forces. Horses were galloping back and forth, men were turning where they stood, shouts and cries drifted across the plain to the army of rain and night. Morgoth stood in his stirrups. In the far distance he could see movement on the ridge to the north of the kingdom's army. Men were forming up and moving forward. He strained his eyes to see more clearly. That was the direction from which he expected Hoff to appear, but the rising dust kicked up by all the movement made it difficult to see details. Although the bulk of Morgoth's forces were the Vorgals, whose mind and bodies had been enslaved to his own, the Lord of Rain and Night was surrounded by a small courtier of men whom he had allowed to retain their own powers of thought and decision. Renegades, criminals and outcasts, they came from all over the country. Evil always attracts its own. A Morgoth's inner circle was a man, pitiless, black-hearted, and depraved. All, however, 
were capable warriors, and most were cold-blooded killers. One of them now rode to Morgraf's sides. My lord, he cried, a smile opening on his face. The barbarians are behind Duncan's forces. They are attacking now. Morgraf smiled back at the young man. His eyes were renowned for their keenness. You sure? he asked in his thin, flat voice. The black-clad lieutenant nodded confidently. I can make out the ridiculous horned helmets and their round shields, my lord. No other warriors carry them. This was the truth. While some of the kingdom's forces did use round bucklers, the Scandian shields were enormous affairs, made of hardwood studded with metal. They were over a meter in diameter, and only the huge Scandians, heavily muscled from rowing their wool ships across the winter seas, could bear such heavy shields in a battle for any length of time. Look, my lord, the young man continued, the enemy are turning to face them. And so they appeared to be, the front ranks of the army facing them, were now milling in confusion and turning about. The shouting and noise rose in pitch. Morgoth looked to his right and saw that in the small hill where the king's standard marked the enemy's command post, mounted figures were pointing facing the north. He smiled once more. Even without the forces from across the fissure, Britain, his plan would be successful. Yet Duncan's forces trapped between his hammer of the Scandians and the anvil of his own war goals. Advance, he said softly. Then as the buckler beside him didn't hear the words, he turned his face expressionless and whipped the man across the face with his leather-covered steel riding crop. Sound the advance, he repeated, no more loudly than before. The bugler, ignoring the agony of the whip cut and the blood that poured down from his forehead and into his eyes, raised his horn to his lips and blew an ascending scale of four notes. Along the line of the Walker army, company commanders stepped forward, one every hundred meters. They raised their curved swords and called for the first few hundreds of the Walker's cadence. Like a mindless machine, the entire army took up the chant immediately. This one set at a slow jog pace and began to move forward. Morgoth allowed the first half dozen ranks to pass him, then he as in attendance urged their horses forward and moved with the army. The Lord of Rain and Night felt his breath coming a little faster, his pulse beginning to accelerate. This was the moment he had planned and waited for over the past fifteen years. High in his windy rain-swept mountains, he had expanded his force of walkers until they formed an army that no infantry could defeat. Without minds of their own, they were almost without fear. They were inexorable, they would suffer losses no other troops would bear and continue to advance. They had only one weakness, and that was facing cavalry. The high plateau were no place for horses, and he had been unable to condition their minds to stand against the mounted soldiers. He knew that he would lose many of his own troops to Duncan's cavalry, but he cared little about that. In a normal confrontation, the king's cavalry would be a decisive factor in the battle. Now, however, Split between the Wargals and the attacking Scandians, the numbers would be insufficient to stop him. He accepted the fact that Duncan's cavalry would cause immense losses among his troops without a calm. He cared nothing for his army, only for his own desires and plans. Faster! he cried, sliding his huge broadswords from his scabbard and wielding it in a gigantic circles over his head. The Wargals didn't need to hear the word. They were bound to him in an unbreakable linkage of minds. The cadence of the chant increased, and the black army began to move faster and faster. In front of all, all was confusion. The enemy first turning to face the Scandians, now saw the new threat developing at their rear. They hesitated. Then for some account unaccountable reason, they responded to free horn blast by drawing to either side, opening a gap in the heart of the line. By drawing to either side, opening a gap in the heart of the line, Morgoth screamed his triumph. He would drive his army into the gap, separating left and right wings of the army. Once an army front line was broken, it lost all cohesion and control. It was more than halfway defeated. Now in their panic, the enemy was presenting him with the perfect opportunity to strike deep into their hearts. They had even left the way open to their own command center. A small group of horsemen standing on the royal standard on a hill. To the right! Morgoth screamed, pointing his sword towards Duncan's eagle standard. As before, the Woggles heard the words and his thought in their minds. The army wheeled slightly, heading for the gap. And now, through the chanting, Morgoth heard a dull drumming sound. An unexpected sound. Hoofbeats. A sudden doubt in his mind communicated instantly to the mind of his army. 
The advance faltered for a moment, then cursing the woggles, he drove them forward again. But the hoofbeats were still there, and now peering through the clouds of dust raised by the enemy, he could see the movement. He felt a sudden overpowering surge of fear, and again the woggle army hesitated. And this time, before he could mentally flail them forward, the curtains of dust seemed to part, and a wedge of heavy cavalry, fully armored at the gallop, burst into sight, less than a hundred meters from his army front line. There was no time to form the sort of defensive square that was infantry's only hope against a cavalry attack. The armored wedge smashed into the extended front line of the Wargals, collapsing the formation and driving into the heart of Morgoth's army. And the farther they penetrated, the wider the gap became as the wedge shape split the separate Wargals, just as Morgoth had been planning to do to his enemy. Now Morgoth heard one long rising horn blast in the distance. Standing high in the stirrups, he cast his glance left and right and saw from either wing of Duncan's army more cavalry deploying, driving in on his flanks, smashing his formations. Dimly, he realized that he had been exposing his army to the worst possible situation they could have contrived, caught in the open by full force of Duncan's cavalry. Over the years, Sir David of Carraway Fief had studied the tactics of cavalry in battle. He knew that the major effect of the cavalry charge came in the first moment of thunderous impact as horsemen drove into the enemy line. With the full momentum of the charge behind them, their three meter long lances smashed through arm of flesh and bone and hurled enemy troops back in disarray to be trampled under the horse's hooves. But once the horsemen lost their momentum and a general melee formed, their major advantage was lost. Accordingly, he had trained the Aralyn cavalry in a new series of maneuvers. After that first thundering charge, the cavalry that had hit the center of the walker line withdrew and quickly reformed. Each company of 80 cavalrymen now split into four arrowhead formations of 20 troopers each, the formation riding on one behind the other. The cavalry approaching from either wing were already deployed in the same formation. Now as a boggle signal sounded, they employed a tactic that Sir David had christened the hammer blows. The leading arrowheads that thundered forward and crashed into the walker line, scattering dead and wounded walkers through other side as they drove in. Then, before their momentum was lost, they pivoted their horses and galloped away, splitting to either side. A few seconds behind them, the second wave was already at the gallop, giving the walkers no chance to recover. They smashed into the line, lances thrusting, horses trampling. Then, before the walkers could come to close quarters, the second arrowhead swung about and withdrew, making room for the third wave to come crashing in after them. As the fourth squadron began to gallop forward to attack, the first was already reforming behind them, ready to begin the whole process over again. Along the line, the Aralyn cavalry hit the Wogel army with a rapid non-stop series of devastating hammer blows, sending a savage bear-like soldiers reeling at twenty different points, cutting the line into a series of disjointed, uncontrolled groups which were more than stuck in their own turn. From his central vantage point, Morgoth watched in rays as his lines were systematically cut to pieces. There was no tactic he could devise to counter certain David's brilliantly executed battle plan. Even if there had been, he could never have communicated to the Vorgals. The simple minds understood basic commands. Advance, fight, kill. Their major advantage in battle was their implacable savagery and a total confidence in their own eventual victory. But now there was a new presence on the battlefield, casting its shadow over the Wargal army. Fear. They had an innate fear of cavalry, and Morgrove sensed the first flickering premonition of panic and defeat amongst them. He tried to force them forward, willing them to advance, but the fear and their helplessness against these new Ireland tactics were too strong. They still fought ferociously, the swords and short spears took a fierce toll on the horsemen they could reach, but their result was beginning to buckle, along with their formation, and Morgoth knew it. Screaming with fury, he sent a mental order he had sent only once before, retreat. Then he wheeled his horse, and with his henchmen behind him, galloped back through his fleeting army, clearing a path with his sword as he went. Three step past, there was a hopeless tangle as thousands of the rear guard tried to force their way through the narrow gap in the rocks. There would be no escape for him there, but escape was the last for thought on his mind. His only wish now was for revenge against the people 
who had brought his plans crashing into the dust. He drew his remaining troops in a defensive half-circle, their backs to the sheer rocks that bared the way to the high plateau. Seething in fury and frustration, he tried to make sense of what had just happened. The Scandian attack had melted away as if it was never there. And then he realized that it never had been. The soldiers advancing down from the ridge wore a Scandian helmet and carried Scandian shields, but had been a ruse to draw him forward. The fact that they had the helmets and shields meant that something, somewhere horse forces had been defeated that could only have been accomplished if someone had led an intercepting force throughout the impenetrable tangle of the thorn tree forest. Someone? Deep in his mind, Morgoth knew who what that someone was. He didn't know how he knew or why. He knew it had to be a ranger. There was only one ranger who would have done it. Halt. Dark. Bitter hatred surged in his heart. Because of Halt, his fifteen-year dream was crumbling before his eyes. Because of Halt, fully half of his vocal soldiers were laying broken in the dust of the battlefield. The day was lost, he knew, but he would have his revenge on Halt, and he was beginning to see the way. He turned to one of his captains. Prepare the flag of truce, he said.